My name is Sarah Boleen. I'm the events coordinator here. And on behalf of the entire staff, uh, we're so pleased to welcome you. And I'm so pleased to welcome Taye Selassie tonight uh, for her novel, Ghana Must Go. Now, I was watching a little video to prepare for this evening. And she was asked what annoyed her most about book reviews, about book critics. And well, I'm sorry to say, Taye, this book is dazzling. <laughs> The story of Kwaku Sai and his family, I was dazzled. It dazzles. It really, truly does. Uh, so sorry, but I'm going to use that adjective. Uh, Taye studied at Yale and at Oxford, and her story, The Sex Lives of African Girls, appeared in Best American Short Stories 2012. You can ask any of my colleagues here. The minute I finished this book, I could not stop talking about it. So I'm so glad tonight is finally here. Please join me welcoming Taye Selassie to Politics and Prose. So this is a Harvard chair. It is a Harvard do, chair. Do you have a Yale one? <laughs> Get up. Thank you. I'll try to bring a little light to this weary toss chair here. <laughs> like Mr. Rogers, I'll just slip out of my jacket. <laughs> so thank you so much for coming um, this evening. This is the fourth of 17 stops on my book tour, but um, absolutely one of the most special. There are more people here who make me smile bigger than I can afford to while also reading. So I will not do the normal thing of, you know, looking studiously down to read and then making eye contact with the audience because um, the waterproof makeup doesn't come with a money back guarantee. So <laughs> we'll just do the best we can to um, muscle through like this. I feel so professorial. So I said yesterday in Baltimore that um, I was sort of tickled by a comment that I'd read about the novel wherein a reader um, imagined that I had written Ghana Must Go to particularize the African experience for a Western audience. And I thought this was interesting because I would have um, argued that all literature exists to particularize the human experience, regardless of the continent from whence those human beings come. And I joked that um, I put so much of myself simply into choosing the words with which to particularize human experience and into finding the rhythm and the lyricism that I don't really have time to kind of get up in the morning and say, hello, Western audience. <laughs> I would like to speak to you of my particular African experience. But it did make me laugh this morning when my amazing media escort, Christina Sprague, thought to bring me this excerpt from a special report in The Economist. Speaking of the, um, the, the notion of audience, so I'm actually going to start not by reading from my text, but by reading from The Economist, because this was just too good. So it says... Three students are hunched over an iPad at a beach cafe on Senegal's Cap Vert Peninsula, the westernmost tip of the world's poorest continent. They are reading online news stories about Moldova, one of Europe's most miserable countries. One headline reads, four drunken soldiers rape woman. Another says, Moldovan men have a 19% chance of dying from excessive drinking and 58% will die from smoking related diseases. Another, others deal with sex trafficking. And then the gem, such stories have become a staple of Africa's thriving media, along with austerity tales from Greece. They inspire pity and disbelief, just as tales of disease and disorder in Africa have long done in the rich world. I, um, I didn't want to split hairs. I did want to note that there actually are many rich countries in Africa, but I take the point. <laughs> and I just, um, before, I, before I read from my novel, I'll just encourage us all to remain you know, light and open-minded about these notions of audience because all of you are my audience and I'm so grateful that you are. I certainly write for nothing more and nothing less than the love of literature, which I think binds all writers to readers. So I'll read from the middle of the book. How many people have read Ghana Must Go? 
Okay. <laughs> okay, I won't. I, I will try my hardest not to give anything away about the plot. So you, you'll know if you've just opened the, um, if you just cracked open the novel that Kwaku dies, but he does that in the first two words. It's not a spoiler. <laughs> it's just, you know what I mean? That's, you know, as advertised. And then um, that's part one, that's called Gone. And then part two is called Going, and part three is called Go. And in part two, um, whence I'm reading, Olu. Kweku and Fola's oldest son is recounting the evening that he went to go ask for his daughter's hand, I'm sorry, for his wife's hand in marriage. And we are now, he's gone with Ling, his wife, to talk to her dad, Dr. Wei. And Dr. Wei, after Ling storms off, says the following to Olu, the oldest son. Can you guys hear me okay? Okay. Also, you a little soft? Okay, let me. A little more volume? Okay. Oh my gosh, I've always wanted to say, can you turn my mic up? <laughs> okay, can, oh wow, can you hear me? All right. I had the nerve to describe someone in this novel as speaking like a DJ of late night soft rock. I mean, pot calling kettle. Okay, so this is Dr. Wei speaking to Olu. I thought my voice there. Okay. I knew an Olu, Olu Alekun Abayomi. He pronounced the name perfectly. Nigerian, as you'd know top of our class at you pit by a long shot. It's not that I'm racist, far from it. Sir, please. He nodded as if agreeing with himself to continue and crossed his legs, crossing his hands on a knee. It is true that you don't have my blessing and won't have, but not for the reasons that you may suspect. Certainly not the reasons that she does, that Ling does. He glanced at the hallway down which Ling had stormed. Olu shifted too, but to settle in, listening, lulled by the cadence, the professorial tone. Odd how this happened, even now in his thirties, this defaulting to student at the first sign of teacher. When I was in grad school in Pittsburgh, fine city, I befriended a fair number of Africans, men, all of them men, unsurprisingly, engineering, just grown-up boys playing with toys, sipped his tea. They'd come from all over, some wealthy, some destitute, but all of them brilliant, per pure genius, those five. The hardest working men in our cohort, I tell you, all bafflingly good at the math, smoothed his hair. Americans call Asians the model minority. At one point, this may have been true, recent past, but now it's the Africans. I see it in the classroom. Asians are through, we got fat. No, don't laugh. You never saw overweight Asians, not young ones, not back when we came when the girls were still young. I see them all over now, Koreans, Chinese, on the train, on the campus. It's the beginning of the end. A fat Asian child can win a spelling bee, maybe, but a science fair, no. It's the Africans now. I'm serious, you're laughing. But Olu couldn't help it. Dr. Wei started also his deep, bossed gong laugh. I say this to say that I admire the culture, your culture, its respect for education above all. Every African man I have ever encountered in an academic setting excelled, barring none. I haven't met a single lazy African student, or a fat one for that matter, in 40 years here. I know it sounds crazy, we laugh, but believe me, I teach undergraduates, I see it every day. African immigrants are the future of the academy and the Indians. He paused here to finish his tea. While Olu sat smiling, an odder thing still, to be enjoying Dr. Wei's conversation. Ling had always reviled him as arrogant, unyielding, charming to a point, and indifferent beyond. She'd never gone home for vacation in college, finding overseas community service work to do instead. She'd skipped her sister's wedding so as not to see her father and ignored the man's calls when they came twice a year, the one, September 2nd, for an off-key happy birthday, the other, Chinese New Year, for Kung Hai Fat Choi. Olu knew better than to probe, and he didn't. For 15 years almost, had never once asked, honey, why don't we drive out to Newton to see them, or... What did he do to you? Never once asked. And Ling didn't either. What had happened to his father? Why they'd never been to Ghana. They'd been everywhere else. 
why he'd balked only recently at an email from Fola, inviting them for dinner on Christmas instead. They hung there between them, in Alston, New Haven, now a ten-minute walk from where Olu once lived. All the questions and heartbreaks, unanswered, untreated, just left there to dry in the silence and sun. So Olu was shocked now to find himself smiling, at ease with this man whom Ling hated so much. There was something even appealing about Dr. Wei's manner, the efforts of the fastidious mathematician to make friends. As smug as he seemed, the hair-smoothing betrayed him. Dr. Wei was self-conscious of what was unclear. Perhaps of the accent that coded his consonants, a threat to the facile delivery, the R's. Perhaps of the slightness of build, further slighted by nearness to Olu's own wide-chested frame. Perhaps of the sadness alive in his pupils, as present as laugh lines around his bright eyes. Or of something else, dark, Olu couldn't see what, but could sense that this man was no stranger to shame and was opening his mouth to say interesting or such like when Dr. Wave smoothed down his hair and went on. You know, I never understood the dysfunctions of Africa, the greed of the leaders, disease, civil war, still dying of malaria in the 21st, 21st century, still hacking and raping, cutting genitals off, young children and nuns slitting throats with machetes, those girls in the Congo, this thing in Sudan, as a young man in China, I assumed it was ignorance, intellectual incapacity, inferiority perhaps. Needless to say, I was wrong, as I've noted. When I came here, I saw I was wrong. Fair enough, but the backwardness persists even now, and why is that? When African men are so bright, as we've said, and the women too, don't get me wrong, I'm not sexist. But why is that place still so backward, I ask. And you know what I think? No respect for the family. The fathers don't honor their children or wives. The Oluwainu, Oluwaleku no Bayomi, had two bastard children plus three by the wife. A brain without equal, but no moral backbone. That's why you have the child soldier, the rape. How can you value another man's daughter or son when you don't even value your own? I will talk. <laughs> Olu was silent, too startled to speak. You can't. Dr. Way opened his hands, QED. Your mother, for example, Ms. Savage, not Mrs., with a different last name than yours. Sai, is that right? I'm assuming, and it is just an assumption, I acknowledge, that your father left your mother to raise you alone? Olu sat, frozen, too angry to move. Exactly. And there's your example, your father. The father is always the example. He paused. Now you may say, no, no, I'm not like my father. No, Olu mumbled. And that's what you think, but I'm just like my father. I'm proud to be like him. Just barely a whisper through Olu's clenched teeth. Dr. Wei caught off guard, tipped his head, and looked at Olu, who, hands and chest trembling, looked steadily back, said, He's a surgeon like I am, the best in his field, and the rest in an outpour, one soft, seething rush. The problem isn't Ling wants to marry an African. It's not that she's marrying me, and she will. No, the problem is you, Dr. Wei, your example. You're the example of what they don't want, both of them, Ling and Lian, and why is that? Why aren't there pictures of them here in your place? What was it? The father is always the example. Both of your daughters prefer something else. Ling appeared now in her coat holding Olu's. Amen, lacrimosa, the chloral climax. Dr. Wei cleared his throat, but before he could speak, Ling grabbed Olu and left, out the door, just like that. Then, laughing together, a flute and a cello, the car windows open to birds and a breeze. You were there the whole time? I was listening from the bathroom. Leanne was on speaker. I love you so much. She was crying. Let's get married tonight. Go to Vegas. Right now? It's been 14 years, fuck it, why not? Have we ever been to Nevada? Wait, where's the Grand Canyon? Arizona, go to Logan, she said, and he did. Then the little white wedding chapel, six hours later, Ling and Olu in Vegas, of all places. <laughs> Where are the audience microphones? Oh, <laughs> oh. Hi, it's like Oprah. <laughs> Hi. Okay, so.
So I am Yanin, and your writing and your voice resonated with me. I was like, oh my God, that's how I feel sometimes. And I am an immigrant girl. And I just wanted to know, when you were writing the book, there's a lot of parallels between your characters and your life, so to speak. Mm -hmm. How much of it would you say is a reflection of your your life mm -hmm. or you know your childhood and how much of it is a reflection of the immigrant people that you know mm -hmm. you know first generation and their relationship with society it's an excellent question um so i say that i have a story it's um i think it's better suited as i've said to soap opera than literary fiction <laughs> but this isn't it this is absolutely the story of the Sai family and these six characters who one day appeared miraculously in my head and more importantly in my heart. However, because I was tasked to tell their story over the course of 336 pages and wanted to do so in a convincing manner, I did borrow what you might call some surface details from the lives of my family members, such as my father is a surgeon from Ghana, the father here is a surgeon from Ghana, my mother is devastatingly beautiful and Nigerian and Scottish, and the mother here is devastatingly beautiful and Nigerian and Scottish. My twin sister, Dr. Yetza Twakli, trained at Harvard Med before going to Hopkins, and the doctors here trained at Harvard Med <laughs> before going to Hopkins. My sister and I went to Yale, and the youngest daughter, Sadie, went to Yale. But other than that, there are no similarities between <laughs> this book and my family, and I would be um, horrified if my really upstanding um, members of the community, family members were implicated in any way by, by what I've told here. Because the heart of these people, who they are, their, their, their very characters, um, are figments of my imagination. But, but beyond that, they're, they are things that I've received. Not from you know conducting interviews or even the 30-some um, years that I've spent observing my family, but, but simply from trying to open myself to something that comes from beyond me. Thank you. You're, it's my pleasure. Thanks for coming. Thank you for your beautiful readings. Um, I was wondering, for those maybe who aren't familiar, if you could share a little bit of the story of how this novel did come to be and your sure. journey to, I think it was a shower, to the page. Yeah. Um, because I think it's pretty amazing. Absolutely. Um, yes. Taye's Journey to the Shower by <laughs> Taye Selassie. <laughs> I was dirty. No, no, no. So <laughs> what, it, okay, because I will say because there are some um, very, very well-educated graduates of Milton Academy here in the crowd, I um, told my mom when I was four and my dad that I wanted to be a writer and I meant it. And then for the next um, 15 or so years, I did very little else with, with um, particularly good results other than reading and writing. But when I got to Yale, I became scared. I was afraid to bring my creative writing into this very competitive, very, um, well, judgmental space. And it felt like a thing that was too fragile and too vulnerable to do in such a robust environment. So I stopped. I then um, graduated and I looked at my family. My father is a doctor, my mother is a doctor, my twin is a doctor, and then my father's various and sundry other offsprings are mostly doctors too. And I thought I should go get a PhD because I can't really add and subtract. So there is no way that I could ever become a medical doctor, which is how I ended up at Oxford doing um, an MPhil and then carrying on into the PhD program. Thank God, as I was coming to my senses, an amazing author came to Oxford to get an honorary degree, and that's Professor Toni Morrison. And for Professor Toni Morrison, <laughs> Um, and when I got back to New Jersey to stay with my dad and his lovely wife, Catherine, I, I went and I continued my conversation with her down the street. She, w in front of my twin and my mother, ended up giving me a deadline to produce some fiction of any kind. And um, while I considered 
very seriously not meeting that deadline <laughs> at some point. I thought that would be, and I did a lot of absurd things up until that point, but I thought that would be one of the most absurd things you've ever done in your life to just be like, hey, Professor Morrison, hi. Yeah, I don't have that fiction that you asked me for, but thanks a lot for your interest and support. Um, so I wrote something, it was sort of something, anything, and that became the sex of African girls. Then she read it and miraculously she liked it, but she said it should be longer because it's very hard to publish a novella these days. In fact, the only person who can really publish a novella these days is me. And that was <laughs> just before the amazing novella, A Mercy, came into print. So I took The Sex Lives of African Girls to Sweden. My dear friend, dear, dear friend Kirsty, for my 30th birthday, took me on this yoga and meditation retreat. And it was my intention while in the, um, really rather punishing cold of <laughs> Hall, Sweden, to make the sex lives of African girls longer. I was there in Sweden trying to do this, and I went to take a shower, and these people appeared. And so Kirstie and I fled Sweden for Copenhagen, where I wrote the first 10 pages of Ghana Musco, which appear in print largely unchanged. Why, after 10 years in which I finished absolutely no fiction, did this story suddenly come, I couldn't say. I, could, I, I genuinely couldn't say. I've, I've quoted Leonard Cohen to death. He said, if I knew, when asked, where do, your, where do your songs come from? He said, if I knew where they came from, I'd go there more often. <laughs> and, you know, I, 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 I definitely, having contractually obliged myself to write a second novel, feel that way. Um, these characters in this story was a blessing, a calling, and an obligation and it was um, my honor to, to fulfill it. Hello. Hi. Hi. Um, this book is written, I mean, meticulously. Everything, like Yetza, everything's meticulous. Your style, <laughs> everything's perfect, the way you carry yourselves. What inspired your style? Like, where did you get that style? Yeah. You know, as the, um, as the people say, we got it from our mama. <laughs> okay. And, um, and my auntie, and my auntie who's here. Here's my auntie Renee. Here's my auntie Gail at the microphone. If you, I say this from the bottom of my heart. If you look at the women with whom I was raised, mm -hmm. in their poise, in their brilliance, in their perseverance, in their strength, in their wisdom, in their elegance, in their, um, I'm looking for a particularly elegant word, in their flyness, <laughs> you will see all of the, all, you know, all of the roots of whatever scraps of all of the same that I've managed to put into this novel. And for them, I am truly grateful. Thank you. Auntie Gail. <laughs> I feel a little bit like I did at graduation from Yale when they kept calling your name <laughs> over and over again. And you walked across the stage and you took the honors and the honors and the honors. It was just magical. Um, that said, I've often heard great writers say that their characters wake them up in mm. the morning. They sure do. And so I wondered if you could share, is that the experience that you've had? And, and how did you, how did that relationship unfold with the characters, if that's true? Yeah, I wish my characters woke me up in the morning. They tend to prefer to stay up with me at night. <laughs> I mean, they are my characters after all. So they are much fonder of Prosecco than they are of coffee. God bless their hearts. And we spent, um, in the early days, in the young days in our romance, we spent many late nights together watching the sun creep up over the rooftops of Rome. And I, um, they, I still hear them now. I still hear them now. I was um, I was having a bit of a, just a little laugh with a gentleman caller in Rome. And I thought to myself, but I said actually, but I'm a dreamer woman, which doesn't really translate that well into Italian. And he was like, what are you talking about? And then I was like, did I just quote myself? <laughs> Has it come to that already? But really what was happening was I think about the lives of these people all the time. Yeah. And they, when I write, I'm sure you can tell, it's a, it's a challenge for me not to read too quickly because I write really quickly. When the words are coming, they're coming fast. And if they're not coming fast, alas, they're not coming at all. And, and so it's as, if, it's as if the words are washing over me like waves. And those waves continue to wash even, even now. And um, yeah, I would say my relationship with these characters progressed only insofar as I learned to listen to them 
to try to still myself as much as I was able to so I could hear their words and not the mm. sort of repetitive, anxious words that tend to um, swirl around in my head. And um, they've, they've taught me more than, mm, than I would great. otherwise know. What a gift. Thank you. What a gift indeed. Thank you. Hello, Sister Hi, Noma. Hi. It's so unreal to be here. Um, just watching you, um, <laughs> watching everybody see what I've seen um, for a long time. Um, I knew Tai, well. Okay, no, but it's like Oprah, but you can't make me cry. <laughs> that know. would be, you know what I mean? That'd be a little. Okay. okay. Well, right. my question is this. <clears throat> um, you mentioned something that you were given a deadline. Um, being the brilliant student that you've always been, you met your deadline. It was an external deadline in a sense. Yeah. For any other writer who doesn't have that external deadline, how would they go about putting their heart, their mind, their energy, everything they've got to actually bring into life whatever is it is that's within them to actually bring forth? Give it to yourself. If uh, is what is a, is what I would say. I received that deadline to write a piece of fiction to share with Professor Morrison from her. But before that, I had set my 30th birthday as a deadline to stop pussyfooting around, leave my job, and write. And so I think in many ways the one, I like to think the one maybe be, be, begot the other, begat? Anyway, um, in, in the sense that I, I, had dis I had made an agreement with myself that the only thing that I wanted to do with my 30th decade was to become what I already was. And I had said so young that I was a writer and I'd known so early that I loved poetry above, any, above all other things, but I just, I couldn't muster up the strength to do it. So to a writer who doesn't, you know what, never mind that. If there is a writer here, I'm giving you a deadline. <laughs> Like, you now have any writer here. I'm saying this from the bottom of my heart, and I can see you. I can, like, see your little twinkling eyes in the audience. Little twinkling eyes back there. I'm giving you a deadline. You have until March 15th, 2014, to get the thing going. You don't have to finish it, because I didn't finish the manuscript that I sent to Professor Morrison, and God bless her, she didn't tease me for it. But you have to start. You have to start. You have to start. Thank you. You're welcome. I can't claim to have read the book yet, Hi. Um, Hi. but I found it interesting uh, when you were talking just now and also just thinking about being, a, being an African immigrant in the United States or the children of Af African Im immigrants, that there's a theme of an outside looking in. Mm -hmm. You're in Europe writing about a family in the United States. You're an American writing about an African family in a sense. Mm. I'm wondering if you can speak about that and, and what kind of perception or eye you bring to the story. Sure. I did an interview with a German, uh, with German public television, and the host, uh, Wolfgang Herles, he told me that I seemed to have liberated myself from identity, and I'd never thought of identity that, of, I'd never thought of identity as something that one need liberate him or her herself from. But as soon as he said it, I sort of thought, you know, by George, he's right. <laughs> I, I live in a lot of different places, Vivek. I mean, we, we met in England, and then I went to New York, and now I'm in Rome, but I go all the time to Accra and so on and so forth. And I, somewhere in that movement, it occurred to me that I see more that looks the same in people and in the world than looks different. Somehow, when I look out at the world, I see, and this can sound a little bit, you know, a little like, let's hold hands and sing Kumbaya while swaying slowly backwards and forwards. But I genuinely mean I see a common humanity. And in that common humanity, I see my own. And so I don't actually anymore, I used to use this construction because it was the one that I'd inherited, but I don't anymore think of myself as outside of anything, looking inside to anything else. But rather, I think I'm just looking around me. I'm trying to make as um, I'm trying to make observations. I look where my attention is drawn, and I see, uh, and I try to write what I see of the human experience. Does that make sense? Okay. Hi. So I have a question about the a little bit about the process of 
kind of going with the uh, publishing house versus trying to self-publish. Okay. So, you know, kind of what led to you finding a publishing house and, you know, how would you advise people who maybe I don't know how you did that. But. OK, so I have yeah, really in a really brass tacks, yeah. brass tacks. Um, I sent 100 pages of my manuscript to the office of my agent through someone who knew him, okay. not in li- not in the literary world, mm-hmm. but just, you know. So step number one, th- I think the crude reality is try to find someone who knows someone who knows someone who knows someone. And again, if you're here and you need someone, you know me. Okay. <laughs> and then have that person send your pages. I'm sorry, let's back up. Write something. Okay. <laughs> then have someone who knows someone who knows someone who knows some. Send the thing you wrote to an agent. Th- this is the way that I did it. Yeah. Then the agent read it. He liked it. He called me on Mother's Day mm-hmm. and asked, do you want to come into the office? Okay. I went to meet him. He said, would you like me to represent you? I said, are you kidding? <laughs> then he, sa- he said, okay, I wrote an outline for the rest of the novel, and he submitted it to publishing houses mm-hmm. with whom he had pre-existing, albeit contentious, relationships. And that was how my book came into the world. But that's not how all books come into the world. Um, I think that self-publishing is, I'm not um, a student of the industry, but I think that self-publishing, as we can see probably by books that are doing very well here, is a very viable option also. And um, I know less about it because it's not the route that I took. But in terms of what do I think, there are there are certain benefits to working with a publishing house, including the fact that I'm you know here on stop four of seventeen on a four country tour, um, which is being called phase one. <laughs> so that is good. That's helpful. Um, but I wouldn't encourage the aspiring writer to think about any of that before attending to step one. Write something, and then call me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Hi. Hi. Sorry. My name is Taryn Hall, and I follow you on Twitter, and I know that you're very involved in photography and a lover of photography, so I wanted to know how your photography or your love for photography factors into your writing. Well, it's a wonderful question, Taryn. I think, I'm I'm told that the writing is very visual, and yeah, and I think that's because, um, I think it's because I, when I when I see things, just the everyday world happens to be exquisitely beautiful to me. I'm um, my eye is just always drawn to how the light is falling across something or the way a color is expressing itself in the same. And so I think when I when it comes to the writing, I spend a lot of a time attending to the way light is falling across people's faces, and that's just because that's the way the images come to me. Um, but music also is a huge influence on my work. Do you listen to Zuntu? No. Do I listen to Ozonto? Mm-hmm. Do you want to bust out a little La Paz <laughs> Toyota right now? Is that what you're asking me? No. Of course I do. I li- but I listen to all kinds of music. I studied piano and cello. I love jazz. I listen to, I'm sure you can hear it. Uh, uh, two friends of mine are amazing musicians, Damon and Jamin. Their name's Rhyme. I just noticed that. But anyway, um, and they, they're they the ones who pointed out to me that my writing bears a resemblance to hip hop. And I of course, I grew up in the coming of age of hip hop music, and it's what I listen to, but also to, you know, Falakuti and Eve Drumming and Tchaikovsky and anything with a line, with a motif, with repetition, with a flow is, is for me. And that's visual, auditory, verbal. Thank you. You're welcome. Ciao, buonasera. Ciao, <laughs> buonasera, come stai? Ma tu parli italiano? Come mai? <laughs> Perché ho uh, vissuto alla per tre anni. Sono coach G. Fantastico. Uh, the, uh, amici de uh, Earthrun, de Arlene. This is a friend <laughs> who lived for three years in Italy and is, and, is, and is a friend of a wonderful, wonderful woman named Earthrun Cousin. Yeah, uh, La tua domanda? Uh, <laughs> uh, we'll go back to English. No, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so. Ma se voi possiamo parlare italiano tutto il tempo? No, they don't. I can tell by their faces yeah, they're not having said, that. You said you, you talked too, too fast for me. Excuse me. <laughs> so, no, but um, yeah, I, I wanted to say I I loved your your reading. That was really great. Uh, it was Grazie. My, this is my first <laughs> book reading, and um, I don't know how we didn't cross paths when we were in Rome because we were always friend of Gail was also. Uh, yeah. So we we're always. I don't friend. stand out in Italy at all. <laughs> 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 but um, being a person who I lived in Rome for three years and you're living and lived there, um, I was wondering if you thought that the chaos slash laid back 
kind of culture there allows you to free your creative mind more than being here. Um, Absolutely. For myself, it did. So I, I was just absolutely, absolutamente. I, um, I say that I think uh, Southern Italy is the northernmost part of the African diaspora, and I, I feel that way. I, when I got to Rome, I saw these three palm trees, and my, my cousin Kemi had has has always told me that my uncle Bumi loves going to Rome, and quietly I was always like, why? <laughs> I mean, Paris, okay, because it's part of our like global post-colonial people, right. but Rome, really, there like two minutes in Ethiopia whereby they just ended up marrying all the people and couldn't really get an, imp an empire going no 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 <laughs> like this is not for me and then when I got there I got there intending to stay for four weeks and I ended up moving there because I found that that the pace the slower pace is is much more conducive to allowing the work to come but also the sheer commitment to beauty that you see walking around that city the fresky, the churches, the cobblestones, back to the way the lights hitting buildings, but mostly the attention that that city is paying to detail. I sometimes, when I'm stuck, I walk five minutes down the street and I look at a painting by Caravaggio, a painter to whom one of my best friends, Heather, introduced me. And I just look at the way this painter creates darkness by layering and layering and layering and layering the paint. And in many ways, this inspires the way I tried to write this book, just by layering and layering and layering and layering the truth. So living in a city that loves art, I think, is incredibly healing and nurturing to artists. Grazie mille. Ci vediamo dopo. How is the time? Do we have any other questions? One more question. Come on up. Hi, um, I'm Daniela. I'm Marlene's sister. <gasps> Hi, <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know any Italian, so I won't speak any. It's okay. um, so you sort of answered my my question, and, and as someone who has lived all over the world, I wanted to know like where did you feel? Where do you feel most at home, or is that just wherever you go, you make it your home? I feel most at home where I see smiling faces, where the people I love are nearby, or at least a uh, you know, a free Wi-Fi connection away. <laughs> and um, and that's just about everywhere. Yeah, praise God. Thank you so much for coming this evening. It's so much to talk to you.